praat met Gimet Jansen over psychedelische kookkunst. Good afternoon and welcome to the program. I'm Jim Leonard. And on the show today, we're very privileged to have Chimmy Jansen, who is the author of a fascinating and informative book called The Altered Consciousness Cookbook, A User's Guide to Psychotropics. Uh, Chimmy, when I read the book, I'm struck really on every page by your obvious enthusiasm for exploring your consciousness with psychedelics. Can you tell us why you have such a fascination with this? Um, I suppose it's really from my experiences. Um, each experience that I've had has really pushed me to, to go further into exploring my consciousness with psychedelics. Um, I suppose the, the interesting uh, variety of experiences and um, I know the amazing sort of states of consciousness that can be reached through psychotropics um, is quite, quite an amazing um, experience to, to seek. And um, I don't know, I, I quite enjoy um, the places that psychotropics bring me. And yeah, I like them a lot. Yeah. Um, now, everybody knows that some psychedelic drugs are illegal, but is it really necessary to break the law to explore these kinds of substances? Um, absolutely not. Um, I think most most of the legal um, psychedelics are equally as strong and um, uh, definitely have just as much value for exploring your consciousness as the illegal ones. Um, and some of the legal uh, psychedelics are actually um, well a lot better for you uh, physically and also mentally. I think um, I know. I think. Through the use of uh, mushrooms and ayahuasca, um, the the places that they bring you and the the effect they have on your body are far more positive than than, for example, LSD. Um, and I think, in some ways, they're actually preferable. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about mushrooms for a moment. Um, you've had numerous experiences taking mushrooms, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about one of the more interesting experiences that you've had with mushrooms? Well, um, I suppose the most interesting experience I had with mushrooms was um, taking them in, in the dark in my bathroom. Um, and I found that to be uh, quite, quite incredible. And um, well, I, I took um, uh, quite a large dose and then closed, closed my bathroom door and filled my tub with uh, quilts and mattresses and um, lay down, and uh, within a short time, I found that that my own aura seemed to be uh, made up of of a sort of alien intelligence, um, a kind of grid of um, sort of lines that surrounded me, and seemed to move about my body and sort of place pressure on different points on my body, and seemed to be kind of communicating messages. Um, and over time, the the intensity of the experience built up and um I got visions of sort of um the the way of the functioning of the universe and sort of the the history of the universe and sort of a lot of things which which really um i know made me rethink sort of the way that I look at the the universe and how we're here and um yeah um at the end of the the experience uh I found that yeah, um, I felt much stronger and sort of like my presence uh, um, within my body and the place where I was felt felt much more grounded and um, sort of like like what I was seeing had been enriched through my experience and my own sort of uh, perception had been somewhat cleared and that had a lasting effect for some time. So you really found that your perceptions were clearer after this experience with mushrooms? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I found that I, I was able to see sort of um, subtle energies sort of flowing through the house and surrounding myself and uh, my cat and um, sort of, yeah. And the, the whole sort of feeling was that somehow um, rather than, than um, hallucinating and seeing things which were I know 
blatant uh, creations of my own consciousness, I was actually able to see more of what was actually outside of my consciousness um, and in the world around me. That is really fascinating. And so this isn't something that you do only for kicks or something, but you actually do this to get benefits, it sounds like. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, I think that, that using um, psychedelics um, has a lot of benefits, and mostly in sort of opening up um, your views towards um, the world and giving you a sort of loosening your, your own sort of, um, uh, well, ego sort of grip on the way things are and allowing you to sort of be open to to sort of um, see the world th through through a clearer picture not just the way that you've been taught things are or the way that um, I don't know the way that you think that things are but but kind of closing all that off and and just looking hmm. and so um, if you take mushrooms several times. Is it more or less the same experience each time or do you really have something quite different each time? Um, no, yeah, it's definitely different each time. Um, set and setting play an important role in that and that would be kind of yeah, getting, getting yourself into a position um, and a place where you feel comfortable. Um, in, in each mushroom experience, um, being in the right um, frame of mind and, and the a situation which you enjoy um, will give you an infinitely uh, more enjoyable experience than, than taking it without forethought um, in a place that, that you wouldn't normally um, want to be. Um, so I think, I think the, yeah, um, each experience is kind of, well it's not only built up on the place and the sort of mindset you have, but also um, the things within you that sort of come out during it. I mean, I think that the psychedelics are really kind of, um, they mirror your own state of consciousness. And so how you go into the experience will sort of determine the experience you have. Sure. Now, mushrooms are quite easily available in the Netherlands and in some other countries too. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for somebody who wants to try mushrooms for the first time? Um, well, definitely to start off with um, a moderately low dose and also um, here in Amsterdam there's quite a variety of available. Um, so certain certain mushrooms I think are better to start with than others. For example, um, the Cubensis or Philosopher's Stones are um, quite good mushrooms I think for first experiences or first few experiences. Um, and other mushrooms like the Copalandia um, would be probably better to, to do once you're more experienced. And these are things that people can get at uh, smart shops and also at the Botanic Herbalist, isn't mm -hmm. that true? Yeah. Um, there's, I think, probably around 40 places in Amsterdam now selling, selling mushrooms. Um, and some, some of them are really directed towards um, all the different um, hallucinogens and some of them um, uh, are less geared towards it, and I think especially for your first time, trying to find a place that where you can find information as well as the, the actual psychotropics is a, a good place to to start. Well, I would certainly recommend your book to anybody who's interested in this subject. Really, whether they intend to take them themselves or if they're only interested in a more general way, I found that your book has lots of practical information for people who want to experiment with these things, and. Your book is available at the Botanic Herbalist, isn't it? Yeah. And could you tell us the address of the Botanic Herbalist? It's the Cornelis Trust, uh, number 37 in Amsterdam. That's great. Um, and so if somebody is going to be taking magic mushrooms for the first time, what dose would you think would be a good trial dose for that? Um, well, if they're taking the Cubensis, I would say probably um, a gram, a gram and a half, something like that. Um, that should basically just uh, increase their color perception um, and perhaps uh, uplift their mood. But it won't really be a fully psychedelic experience, but they'll definitely get a feel of, of the um, mushrooms' effects. Mm -hmm. And so even if somebody is not doing really a psychedelic dose in the first place, you think that they can have an interesting and beneficial experience? 
Oh, definitely. Um, I think um, doing low doses is um, very beneficial for um, certain situations and especially uh, for earlier users. But for example, if you're taking a low dose, um, you can do it um, with uh, at a party or um, in places where you're directly uh, confronted by public. Whereas uh, at higher doses, it's communication might become more difficult. So I think low doses are, are definitely beneficial in, in a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then um, you've also had some experiences with ayahuasca, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Um, yeah. The, I think uh, ayahuasca has probably been um, the most interesting of the psychedelics I've tried um, in that it's really kind of uh, pushed me uh, towards a more sort of spiritual um, way of looking at things. Um, each experience has made me feel um, that I'm able to look into myself and kind of look at the the roots of the thoughts that I have and, and kind of confront my own identity and um, uh, allow me to grow and perhaps um, yeah, see more of myself and uh, uh, expand on what I'd like to. Um, and I think probably the m most interesting of my ayahuasca experiences was when I had in uh, Brazil, in which uh, I felt that my whole uh, aura became uh, like a very intense uh, electric magnetic field, sort of placing a lot of uh, pressure on me. Um, and uh, this steadily, the feeling grew, and uh, at a certain point, uh, the energy, uh, well, was very high, and the music that they'd been playing that evening um, stopped, and uh, the suddenly uh, the voice of an Indian man came out for the speakers and spoke to, to 50 people who were present and all, all the people who were able to recall it um, about the importance of enlightenment in, in our, our lives and seeking that goal of enlightenment. And it was a very interesting experience. And I think that that experience uh, really pushed me towards uh, following a spiritual path. I want to make sure I understand this experience because it sounds really quite fascinating. Um, you don't mean that there was really some person in physical form speaking to 50 people. No. You mean that 50 people all had a shared experience, mm -hmm. like a psychic experience or yeah. something? Yeah. Wow. Definitely. Um, uh, yeah. And it was quite incredible. Um, I pushed me to uh, expand my own beliefs to, to take into account things like um, spirits, reincarnation, um, plausible explanations for, for what had happened because under the my old uh, belief system such an experience couldn't have been possible. Yeah. Um, would you say that after having this shared experience with people that that gave you more insight into others, maybe more compassion for other people? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I mean, I think the, the bonding experience was one of sort of a s strong kind of love and compassion and um, the the whole uh, time that I spent in Brazil that was sort of the the feeling that we were building together and and I think um, kind of the importance of being compassionate and um, sort of uh, trying to reach a state of uh, unconditional love was sort of the the goals that were kind of um, shown during that time so you really feel that you received profound spiritual benefits from this experience with ayahuasca? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, yeah, just um, benefits that have lasted because now I, uh, what I find important in the world has changed a lot. I mean, I think it's pushed me kind of away from materialism and um, yeah, um, tried to, well, since then I've been trying to follow a more sort of uh, spiritual path and look into uh, my own essence and
try and find out, you know, what I really should be doing with my life. This is really fascinating. Um, and so, in fact, the purpose for all of these people who took ayahuasca in Brazil was a spiritual purpose and not just seeking kicks or something like that. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, the, um, the experience in uh, Brazil, we were all um, there really to, to look into ourselves and to grow and um, uh, expand our own sort of uh, spiritual awareness um, together. And um, I mean, I think our goals were definitely not um, simply entertainment. Um, I think, um, and our experiences uh, were all about kind of looking into ourselves and growing from those insights. And at the same time, it is quite an entertaining experience, it sounds like, huh? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the entertainment value of, of psychedelics is um, very high. Um, we, uh, I think all, all uses of um, psychedelics are, um, that makes up a, a large part of why they take them. Um, the uh, visions and um, mm, colors and just the whole uh, atmosphere is very entertaining. Mm -hmm. And people often have experiences that change their lives for the better, it sounds like. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think um, all, all the friends that I have who've, who've um, been taking psychedelics have all had experiences which have uh, really pushed them to, to expand their, their own views and beliefs and uh, understandings of themselves and um, it's all, uh, it's been very beneficial um, because it, it brings to light things that people are often unaware of about themselves or about the world they, they live in. So you really use these as tools for spiritual growth? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. And can you tell us something more about ayahuasca? It's a botanic substance, isn't it? Yeah, it's made up of um, usually just two plants, um, um, one containing DMT and another one containing an MAO inhibitor, which allows the DMT-containing plant to become orally active. Um, and in South America, which is um, where it's uh, from, they make uh, sort of a stew from it and cook it for, for up to a day or even more. Um, and yeah, it's been used for, for probably thousands of years. Wow, for thousands of years. And um, not only for having spiritual insights, but you, you told me that there's also healing properties of ayahuasca. Yeah, definitely. Um, in South America, it's, it's mostly used as a, as a healing tool, um, especially in the traditional uh, tribal communities, um, the the healing benefits of it are, are uh, mostly in I think the the way that they cleanse people's bodies and uh, minds and um, a lot of sort of uh, illnesses are actually based on sort of things that that are rooted in in uh, minds uh, in the minds of the of the sick people and it kind of clears out those things and um, I've heard of numerous uh, incredible healing stories of people who've been healed from um, things like cancer and um, various um, severe ailments that they were unable to cure elsewhere. Well, and so of course this is anecdotal evidence and we, we can't tell people that ayahuasca will heal any particular well, thing. Huh? Yeah, no, definitely not because it's, it's, uh, uh, it's it's not like um, it's a sort of a spiritual healing thing. It's not something that you can sort of say, well, like if you took it into a lab, uh, it might not cure the mice that they test it with. But um, on a spiritual level, it'll cleanse the, the ill person. And I think for, for a lot of things, um, it could definitely be beneficial. But I don't know whether it could really be brought out as a pharmaceutical um, cure for illnesses out in the West. So you had your first experience with ayahuasca in Brazil, is that right? Um, no, I had my first experience here um, in Amsterdam um, with the Friends of the Forest, um, sort of um, a new age um, spiritual group, and um, I really enjoyed it, yeah. Hmm. Um, 
With ayahuasca, it's best, at first at least, to participate with a group that's experienced in administering this to the public, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, uh, there's, there's two groups here in Amsterdam that, that are um, doing ayahuasca sessions, and um, the, both of them I found to be very beneficial to the, to the experience. Um, doing, doing a psychedelic in a group um, really brings your own sort of um, energy into uh, yeah, alignment with others and you feel a lot more, um, mm, I don't know, like you, you're on, a, on the same level with other users and it brings you, uh, makes it a lot easier to have uh, an experience which is um, truly just uh, enjoyable because uh, on your own, the the experience that you have is uh, made up of just your your own what you put into it. Um, but with a group, the whole group's um, experience is guided by the the other people in the group, um, and I think it's very beneficial. Yeah. Um, would you say that? you have gotten spiritual benefit from every occasion when you've taken ayahuasca, or is that rather rare? Um, well, I think it's kind of a progression. Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, each, each experience has been equally beneficial, but I think it's kind of um, like a, each experience is kind of followed on, on a journey um, each each experience kind of shows you a bit more than the previous one, and um, I think rather than than getting weaker, um, each dose that I've taken, although the doses have been the same, has given me more of an effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the groups that gives the ayahuasca ceremony to the public is actually a Christian group, isn't it? Yeah. And so apparently they find that taking ayahuasca makes them better Christians. Well, yeah, um, the, the the group, the Santa Diamond, they're, they're based in Brazil, and there's a, a lot of people in it, and um, I think that it really, sh for them, it takes them a lot closer to to the source of their beliefs, and um, I mean, I think it w would be beneficial for, for any kind of uh, belief system to to take some something which brings them closer to what it is that they're seeking, um, and I think for the Santa Dime, the the ayahuasca is definitely um, a benefit. Yeah. Um, now I know that some people are afraid that if they take a psychedelic, they'll have too much of a confrontation of their own fear. Um, undoubtedly, you've passed through fearful moments taking these substances. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, but I think sort of confronting those fears has made me a lot uh, more able to sort of um, deal with those fears and uh, accept them and go past them. Um, I think if you really uh, experience the source of a fear, it kind of diminishes the fear and um, you're not faced with it in the future. So perhaps the fears that people encounter when they take psychedelics is fears that they had within them anyway. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't think that the, the psychedelics um, carry within them any type of experience. Um, it's the the user that it's what the user really brings to the experience that he experiences, um, and as such, um, although often at a subconscious level, there's fears within people, and under psychedelics they can come out. But um, at least with psychedelics, you you can confront them and actually go past them and allow yourself to, to grow through them. And with all of these things, of course, after a few hours, a person comes down. Well, yeah, that's the best thing. I mean, if, if, you're, um, if you were placed in uh, many of these states of consciousness, um, normally, you know, um, you, you would feel a lot more fear because you wouldn't know, you know, when, when it's gonna go or whatever. Um, and at least with psychedelics, you you always know that you're gonna be uh, back in you know however many hours, um, and that's a great comfort. And so, in many cases, when people have a fearful experience during part of the trip, 
when they come down, they find that the fear is permanently resolved. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, though sometimes they might experience that fear again. Uh, I think it's really just uh, if they can find what it is that's really making them afraid, then then they can definitely get, get through it and past it and not experience it again. And so in your own experience, you have found that it's well worthwhile to pass through experiences like that for the benefits that you receive on the other side. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I think it it sort of makes your own will stronger if you can, you know, uh, face your fears. Because it's really, you know, and if you don't face them, they're just going to be there. And once you face them, um, even if you don't uh, get rid of them, at least you you've kind of grown to the understanding that they are there and, and that alone will make you a lot stronger in the future. And so an experience like this could really make a person more courageous and self-confident, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is really fascinating. Um, and another concern that people have sometimes about um, drugs in general, I mean some people put all drugs together in the same pile, which um, even, even though different drugs have profoundly different effects. But a concern that people have sometimes is that it might be habit forming. Do you think that psychedelics are habit forming for people? Um, no, definitely not. Um, I think uh, each experience is, is a full experience and once you get out of the experience, um, you know that even if you wanted to repeat the experience, if you uh, repeat taking a psychedelic, there's no guarantee that you'll get the same experience that you had last time. So there's no real reason to, to try and make it a habit uh, because each experience will be, you know, its own full experience. And so it's extremely unusual for somebody to want to take a psychedelic every day or something like that. Yeah, I think so, um, definitely. I, I can't really um, see, see people doing that because it doesn't really, um, there isn't really one specific type of effect that you can say, well, that's what I want every day from my psychedelic, yeah. whereas, you know, um, other specific drugs that, you know, have one specific uh, effect, a stimulant, for example, that's something that you can say, well, I'd like that every day, and, you know, it's definitely not going to be beneficial, but, but with psychedelics, there's nothing that you can pinpoint and say that you want every day. And so actually many commonly used things like caffeine and cigarettes are more addictive and habit-forming than these psychedelics. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, and tell us about some other types of psychedelics that you've experienced. Um, well, another interesting psychedelic that I've done is uh, ketamine. And uh, I found that to be an extremely interesting psychedelic because um, it kind of breaks down your own sort of physical boundaries um, and allows you to um, experience ideas as, as um, sort of uh, just a floating uh, consciousness without a physical body and um, you can experience different different perceptions of um, time and of um, physical state um, you could make yourself uh, a millimeter thin and as wide as um, I don't know the city if you wanted um, so it's it's quite interesting and and when you think about metaphysical ideas under the effects you find them to be quite kind of tangible and that's also quite interesting if you think about sort of uh, I don't know uh, the universe being one uh, for example you can truly experience that far more than would normally be possible in your present state of consciousness. Now ketamine is not something that's easily available though is it? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be lucky to encounter it someplace. Well, yeah, definitely. I think um, the most people who who do experience it who do it on um, holidays in India or the Middle East and or the Far East. Um, I think in or in America it seems to be quite popular, but here in Europe it's it's very rare. Mm -hmm. um, now I have heard of some people using ketamine when they go out to a discotheque or something. That's not really how you recommend using it though, is it? Oh no, definitely not. Um, I think ketamine is probably one of the most uh, overwhelming experiences uh, as a psychedelic and uh, I couldn't imagine doing it in a, in a club because uh, without your physical awareness um, you become very discoordinated 
uh, on a few occasions I've had to uh, walk while under the influence and I found this very difficult because your perception uh, of distance becomes greatly distorted and your ability to coordinate your movements and to balance uh, are so reduced that, you know, it, if walking is difficult, I definitely couldn't imagine being in a club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the case of ketamine, it's probably a good idea to have somebody with you who is not taking ketamine at the same time. Is that what you think? Um, well, yeah, I don't know. I suppose for the first few times, but um, it's it's not something that, I mean, I, I want to move on at all, and I don't, there's no real danger of kind of hurting yourself because, well, if you, if you just do it the best way, I think, is if you just lie down and put like a black t-shirt over your uh, face and uh, put on some headphones or play music or whatever, you're not really going to be doing anything just lying down, but, you know, um, the whole experience goes on within your consciousness and um, I don't really see that you're going to be hurting yourself in any way if you you know, you're not going to forget about uh, jumping out of a window or whatever, like they say. Yeah. Um, now, ketamine is not a botanic substance, is it? No. But um, in the case of both mushrooms and ayahuasca and uh, some other botanic substances, some people have told me that they had an experience of somehow the, the wisdom of the plant energy itself. Have you experienced that? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, numerous times with uh, ayahuasca um, and also uh, with mushrooms, I've had the feeling like that the the plants contain within them uh, an intelligent energy or a spirit or whatever you want to call it, which can communicate to you um, and to which you can communicate during the experience. Um, of course. Uh, Experiencing something like that um, does kind of make you uh, rethink your your views about you know what you're experiencing because um, with some some psychedelics which don't have that like um, um, LSD you you wouldn't uh, you would never imagine that or you probably wouldn't imagine that that the stuff that you're seeing is much more than hallucinations but when you're confronted with something that seems intelligent and is, is moving around very perceivably, then it does kind of push you to, to examine the possibility that, you know, spirits within these plants are, are real. Well, that's really interesting because most people who don't experiment with these things go through their life and never have even a single experience of the wisdom of a plant. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, I mean, um, uh, over here in the West, it's it's you know uh, very uncommon to find people with those kinds of views. But if you go to to traditional societies in um, South America, Far East Asia, um, even in the North America, um, you'll find that you know the idea of uh, intelligence within plants is quite commonplace, and um, being being there for uh, many years and yeah um, a lot of the the shamans from from the tribal societies knew a great deal about the intelligence of the plants and learned a great deal from the intelligences of the plants and probably here in the west in ancient times people had more of a connection to plant wisdom too well yeah um, the in uh, in the past uh, uses of uh, Things like Datura and um, in Greece there was the uh, morning or the rye um, drink that was made, and there've there've been um, societies here in, here in the West that have used psychotropics as means towards uh, greater understanding um, and learnt from plants, but I think that's kind of gone. Uh, for the most part, in the present day. Yeah, unfortunately, it seems like nowadays most people are really sort of cut off from nature. I would think that taking some of these botanic substances would give people a sense of profound connection to nature. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think 
probably some of my um, favorite experiences have been done in nature, um, in forests and um, parks. Um, I think that you, you're able to connect with your surroundings a lot better um, whilst under the influence of the psychedelics. I would think that it, there could even be important benefits to society of having people try these botanic substances and feel more profoundly connected to nature. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, I think uh, for for society, um, I suppose if if most people had taken um, psychedelics, um, the the connection would be a lot stronger. I mean, if you look back at the United States in the '60s, you can see just how profound. Um, psychedelic can be on, uh, on the consciousness of a country. And so you think that to some extent the movement toward a healthier ecology even arose from psychedelic experiences? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I don't think it's uh, uh, just chance that, you know, the, the ecology movement started in the 60s in, in America where um, LSD was so prevalent. Yeah. And um, also, if people take psychedelics and they develop more of an empathic sense, more compassion for other people, that seems like that would have profound benefits for society. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at the, the youth culture um, now and um, in the recent past, you'll see that the, the ecstasy use has brought a lot of the youth closer together. Um, and I think it kind of brings, brings out, you know, um, a lot, a lot of warmth from people towards each other that that they normally, you know, don't connect with. Um, and I think that's a great benefit for society. So I would think that you would feel really proud of your book. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very glad to have written it. And uh, I mean, my, my greatest hope is that, you know, a lot of people will read it and, and gra get, um, yeah, an interest in psychedelics and um, decide to to explore their own consciousness. Um, something that I really like about your book is its practicality, because how, how many different substances are in there? Um, well, there's probably around uh, 50 or so. Um, yeah, and I think like through through each one, I put the the dosage, uh, duration, effects, um, experiences, and um, yeah, just um, gave people sort of the basic information that they, that they need to um, get a basic idea of what the um, effects would be. Um, it's really fascinating reading. Some of the um, stories that you have about people's experiences are very entertaining reading. Um, and you think that it's reasonable for people to expect to have experiences like that if they experiment with these things? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think um, the experiences that, that occur whilst under psychedelics are entertaining and, and are interesting. I mean, uh, they can uh, give you something, you know, to uh, think about for quite a while. They're, they can be humorous. Um, I don't know. Um, there's so many different aspects to them that, you know, um, it's really really quite an interesting sort of uh, place to look into because, you know, uh, there's so many experiences that are out there. Uh, it's nice to, to explore them. And yet each individual really has a completely individual experience when they try these things. Isn't that true? Well, yeah. Um, it's like with, uh, with the psychedelics, it's really yourself that you're exploring, although um, there's definitely, um, you know, your surroundings and your history and there's many other influences but it's mostly um, you know what you bringing into the experience um, you know what you expect from the inf uh, experience can have a great effect on it but um, if you if you use them often um, or uh, have had several experiences then you can start to use them um, to kind of explore the world around you also, and, and that's also really interesting. Now, I also found it fascinating in your book that you explain with some things how to make an extraction of the psychoactive substance from plants. Um, for example, you tell how to make an extraction of, um, of DMT from, from certain plants, isn't that right? Yeah. And then um, 
Can you tell us some more about that, about um, the kinds of plants that, um, maybe tell us a little bit about DMT? Well, yeah, um, like DMT uh, is actually present in probably uh, 150 or so different plants um, oh. uh, around the world, and some of the plants grow here in Holland. Um, and the extraction process um, isn't really too complicated, um, just using um, ether and uh, alcohol and lemon juice. Um, there's a few, few uh, different ingredients that you can use for the extraction, but um, yeah, I mean, it's quite, quite amazing just how prevalent these substances are in nature. But this is something that um, following the instructions in your book, a person really could do at home, isn't it? Well, yeah, um, you don't really need to. I suppose if you wanted to make um, easily smokable DMT, you might want to use um, some some solvents, which would be quite hard to get um, as an individual. But um, it is possible to make a, a reasonably good extraction um, with just stuff you can get from, you know, most most uh, pharmacies in town. Wow. And um, the plants for doing this are available at the Botanic Herbalist, is that right? Yeah, uh, we've got a few different plants that you can use as the, the starting material for uh, extracting DMT. Hmm. Um, but I think uh, actually probably uh, making an ayahuasca uh, drink from the plants is perhaps a more interesting way of exploring um, the DMT within them because uh, as ayahuasca you get about um, three to five hours of, of an experience um, which is less intense but more understandable and you can um, retrieve more uh, of the experience at the end of it than with DMT which is very short and quite intense. Um, yeah, I, I think making ayahuasca brew is, is definitely preferable. And um, have you made your own ayahuasca brew, or have you always done it with these groups? Um, I did make my own ayahuasca brew, uh, but uh, at the time I was unsure of the, the dosage of, or of the uh, amount of DMT that was in the plant that I used, and it uh, wasn't actually active dose. Uh, but I'd like to do it again in the future. Yeah, it seems really clear that it's good for people to be well informed when they want to explore these things. And one excellent way to become well informed is to read your book. Yeah, and um, like with the with the ayahuasca, I would also say if you wanted to to extract or if you wanted to make your own ayahuasca, um, definitely first do it with the group because um, doing the ayahuasca with the group allows you to explore the uh, the active uh, activity of the DMT in a warm comforting environment um, and once you've gained some experience in that situation then you can go on to try it at home um, and I advise also doing it with friends even while at home because um, having other people around can really be grounding um, for the experience which is quite good. I want to say again the name of the book that we're talking about it's called The Altered Consciousness Cookbook A User's Guide to Psychotropics by Chimmy Janssen, and this is Chimmy Janssen right here we're talking to. We're very lucky to have you with us. And actually, I think that the world in general is very fortunate to have your book available. And uh, the best place to get that is at the Botanic Herbalist. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. But this is also something that can give spiritual insights. Yeah. Um, I suppose the, the thing that it sort of shows is, you know, I mean, if you have an out-of-body experience um, that in itself, um, you know, pushes you to, to sort of uh, understand what an out-of-body experience is, um, and that can lead to a lot of spiritual insights. Wow. With something that's so readily available, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and so um, we've talked some about the benefits that you've received from psychedelics. We've also talked some about the entertainment value um, because it makes for extremely interesting experiences. And so you feel that it's um, worth the, the cost, it's worth the time that's invested in this, that it's really quite worthwhile for somebody to try these things. 
Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's something that that I'm very um, um, for introducing uh, more widely towards the public because I think it's really um, not given the exposure that it should get because it's such a profound medium to explore yourself. Um, the experiences um, are, you know, unquestionably valuable and um, have a lot of uh, benefits for, for your own understanding of yourself. Now, your research work has been inspired to some extent by Alexander Shulgin, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think Alexander Shulgin's uh, book, Pekal, was the, the first book that I read that really um, pushed my interests uh, towards psychedelics. Um, and yeah, I think his, his own work is, is uh, quite uh, incredible. Uh, and he's made a ad great addition to to a, our understanding of psychedelics and, and our um, our own uh, palette of uh, usable psychedelics. Uh, he invented, I think, probably uh, 150 or so um, new phenylethylamines, uh, like 2CB, uh, 2CT7, and 2CT2, um, which are great psychedelics. Um, yeah, um, now 2CT7 is something that seems to be quite popular here in Amsterdam these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's, that's a, uh, another interesting psychedelic and um, it's kind of starting to take the place of 2CB uh, which uh, was recently uh, banned here in Amsterdam. Um, and yeah, it's, it's uh, a very visual hallucinogen. Um, and somewhat um, dreamy, um, something you'd want to also do lying down at home, not really something you'd want to take at a club. Um, it's not very energizing. Yeah. I have heard some people say that they found it nice for dancing and things like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. And 2CT7 um, is also something that's available widely in smart shops and also at the Botanic Herbalist, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the um, recently, there's been uh, um, some people uh, took the 2CT7 to a lab and tested it and found that it was uh, actually 2CT2. And so I'm not sure whether that was uh, all of the 2CT7 in Holland or just the batch that they tested, but um, apparently there's some confusion as to whether the 2CT7 in stores is actually 2CT7 or 2CT2. But both of those are safe and effective psychoactive yeah. substances. Um, yeah, they're anyway. both. Um, yeah, I think the effects are uh, quite similar, and um, yeah, both of them are, are very interesting. And have you found that 2CT7 increased the amount of um, connectedness that you feel with other people and empathy yeah. for them? Yeah, um, definitely, um, uh, and. Also, my connection with my surroundings uh, felt a lot stronger, um, and um, I found them probably to be one of the, the most um, visual psychedelics that I've taken um, as far as seeing fractals and um, seeing various uh, pictor, uh, pictorial images. Now, your book is already a major accomplishment, especially for someone of your young age. Um, and it's going to help the public a lot. That's clear to me. What are your plans for the future? Um, well, uh, in September I'm going to start university doing biochemistry and psychology and I'd hope to study these um, psychotropics further in the future and bring, bring more of the information about them to the public um, because yeah, I think um, they're not really studied uh, to the degree that they ought to be by um, professional scientists um, because I think they yeah, they pose a profound benefit to, to society. Yeah, and so um, to some extent you hope to model your career on that of Alexander Shulgin, is that right? Um, well, I don't know, I suppose, uh, I don't know, I, I think uh, I'd be, mm, I don't know, 
more interested in uh, I don't know whether I'd have the biochemical uh, uh, abilities that, that he had in, in creating new psychedelics, but I'd like to study um, the psychedelics which are less explored from uh, various regions of the world um, and do uh, biochemical tests to, to test um, you know what's active in them, um, for example in ayahuasca and um, you know try and discover perhaps uh, how the benefits that they give uh, arise from the plants. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's uh, great that you want to do further research on this. We really need to have this knowledge. Um, well, I want to really thank you for your work, and um, I'm uh, really pleased for what this work does for the, for the world. So I thank you very much for being on our show. Okay. Um, well, it was great to be here. Thanks.